Good evening from Washington, D.C., and thank you to those of you joining us from around the world for news from a Catholic perspective. I'm Lauren Ashburn. President Donald Trump says a former campaign aide thrust into the center of special counsel Robert Mueller's Russia probe has already proven to be a liar. On Twitter, the president says the fake news is working overtime. As Paul Manafort's lawyer said, there was no collusion and events mentioned took place long before he came to the campaign. Few people knew the young, low-level volunteer named George, who has already proven to be a liar. Check the Dems. Despite the tweets, today the president deflected questions on the charges. White House correspondent Mark Irons has more. Good evening, Mark. Good evening, Lauren. The case of George Papadopoulos goes right to the central question in the investigation. Did Russia try to sway the election and did Trump's campaign know about it? Today, during an event on tax cuts, the president would not comment. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Questions in the White House briefing centered on the Russian probe. Former Trump campaign manager Paul Manafort is facing 12 charges, including money laundering. I spoke with a former IRS criminal investigator at Catholic University of America who says the charges are a good reminder to all Catholics. The catechism says that you have to be honest and that you have to pay legitimate taxes. Allegedly, Mr. Manafort didn't do that. If he had done, if he had, assuming he has done this, if he had followed the catechism and followed the Ten Commandments, he wouldn't be in this predicament in the first place. Manafort faces up to 80 years in prison, according to a review of the charges by the Associated Press. Professor Warren says special counsel Robert Mueller could use Manafort's testimony to gather evidence against the Trump administration. Professor Warren adds, once Manafort's criminal case is done, the IRS will be sending him a multi-million dollar tax bill related to the assets he purchased in the U.S. using laundered money. Lauren. Mark, what more can you tell us about the guilty plea filed by Papadopoulos and the potential sentence facing Manafort's longtime aide, Rick Gates? White House spokeswoman Sarah Sanders says Papadopoulos is essentially a nobody and he never worked on behalf of the campaign in an official capacity. His guilty plea signals he could avoid prison time as part of an apparent deal to cooperate with Mueller's team. As for Rick Gates, he faces decades in federal prison, up to 70 years, and millions of dollars in potential fines. White House correspondent Mark Irons, thank you. President Trump is continuing his attacks on the media and its reporting of the Russia probe. The president says today in a tweet, the biggest story is not the special counsel's indictments of Paul Manafort and two others, but instead top Democrat lobbyist Tony Podesta stepping down from his post. He says Podesta's resignation, quote, has Dems in a dither. Joining us now, Chris Plant, host of The Chris Plant Show and former CNN Pentagon correspondent. Welcome to the program. Well, thanks for having me. Thank you so much for being here. The Washington Post today did a behind-the-scenes look of what happened yesterday when Donald Trump was sitting on the second floor of the White House watching all of this unfold. Is the media getting that story right? Yeah, I mean, it, 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 is it a day of the week? That, no, the, the news media is not, uh, is not getting the, uh, the story. It's the story they want to tell. Look, the Washington Post started with that. CNN is all over that story today. MSNBC is all over that story today. Uh, it's the image that they want to uh, paint. They don't know what the president was thinking. They don't know what the expression on his face was. So you're saying there were no sources who, was te who were telling them that? <laughs> Melania didn't call up the Washington Post and say, my husband is... Uh, no, I mean, it, is, it honestly has reached the point of absurdity, though. Hasn't it? And, 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 and on this crusade, and the president is right, there is a giant story for the, the press to be pursuing. And look, I'm all for getting to the bottom. Is there any Russian tampering in the election? I want to know. If any Americans were involved in that, I want them held accountable. And I don't care what party they're from. But well, let's be honest. We've been looking very closely at this for about a year now. It's been under a microscope, the whole Russia collusion idea. And you couldn't fill a thimble with the, the evidence with that they've yesterday. accumulated and so far. Donald Trump is also saying all the time about how the media are getting it wrong, just as you're yeah. saying. You talked to the president. You interviewed him. Let's, let's play a clip of what he said about the media to you. CNN is a joke. NBC is a total joke. You watch what they report. It bears no relationship to what I'm doing. Uh, 
but the media is absolutely uh, dishonest, and yeah. I, I have never seen, frankly, I've never seen anything quite like it. Aren't there some journalists, however, who are doing a good job? Is the president going too far by saying what he said? Well, he, he punches them pretty hard, but they deserve to be punched pretty hard. Uh, you know, are they a joke? There, there are some good people at CNN who are trying to do honest work and at other places, too. But the truth is, you never hear their names. You know, they, I mean, this, this is actually true. Having been in the news business for a long time, I had grown up in the news business in a news family. Um, good, solid reporters do good, solid work, and they never make a big splash. Normally, you might break a big story from time to time. Well, as the Washington Post broke the Democrat dossier story. Well, you know, and, and the reality is that story was handed to them by the Clinton people because they wanted to get their spin on it before it came out either on Capitol Hill or through some lawsuit. A judge was about to order documents released that would have revealed who funded the dossier. So the Clinton people got to some friends at the Post so they could get their fingerprints on it and spin it when it was first rolled out. So I started out giving the reporters at the Post credit for breaking the big anymore. story. And then I realized, I, I figured out uh, over the course of the next couple of days, uh, what had actually happened. And there was nothing noble about it. What about conservative media, people who defend Trump, Donald Trump, no matter what? And then we've got to wrap it up. Well, uh, Look, it, sometimes it, it feels like the president is under such withering attack all of the time that while I don't defend everything the president says, I don't, I don't uh, defend everything that he does, his Twitter account is obviously a bit out of control here and there, uh, but the attacks are just completely disproportionate to the reality of what we're dealing with in the United States. And, uh, and I understand the knee-jerk urge to, to defend the president. Uh, and sometimes what I, what I tend to do is I look at the journalism and I, and I look at the facts and I, I fact-check the fact-checkers. And do you find the facts are right? Well, you know, that's the tricky thing about this, uh, this business and the news business is that sometimes you can have an article that's 3,000 words long and there will be several points that are perfectly true and honest and, and uh, truthful, verifiable. But th the bulk of it turns out to be uh, there for political reasons and, and their agendas behind things. And, and uh, it's, uh, you know, it's, a tricky, it's a tricky game. All right. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank Chris you. Plant, host of The Chris Plant Show, former CNN Pentagon correspondent. The White House releases the official portraits of the president and vice president today. These will be the photographs distributed to federal facilities across the country of President Donald Trump and Vice President Mike Pence. Both images also are on sale to the public. The Art of the Donald is a new book about our president and his philosophy of life. Even the president endorsed the book on Twitter. <laughs> Highly respected author Christopher Bedford just came out with the book, The Art of the Donald, Lessons from America's really good book. Joining us now is Christopher Bedford, author of The Art of the Donald and editor-in-chief at the Daily Caller News Foundation. Welcome to the program. Thanks for having me. Happy Halloween. Happy Halloween. I know. I've had my Lady <laughs> Liberty before um, we're talking to our Rome team. There's no question, as you say, that Donald Trump was living the good life before he became president. And it's a lot harder now in the fishbowl. And he's actually almost being criticized for playing golf, as many presidents are. Tell us about what he needs to do in Washington to have his art of the Donald good life continue. Well, he needs to do what he's always done. So he's been underestimated when he first left the boroughs and came into Manhattan and said, I want to build glass skyscrapers instead of brick tenements. No one took him seriously until he started to beat them. And when he first entered public policy with uh, rebuilding Woolman Ice Rink, met Air, uh, Mayor Ed Koch of New York, attacked him, and everyone laughed at him. And he, and he absolutely, he, he dominated and became a force in New York politics. When he first entered Republican politics, it was the same thing, dismissed by everyone. But just through his entire life, he's always been underestimated, and no one takes you seriously until you win. So he has to get some of his legislation passed. He has to get more than just executive orders and more than just restructuring the U.S. government passed. And at that point, I think he can go back to living a little bit better of a life here in D.C. In your book, you write about the rules learned from President Trump. One, if you're doing something new, the old rules don't apply. Here's a section of that rule that you wrote about. Trust yourself. Trust the people on the ground. Solicit opinion from every source and do what you know to be right. Don't apologize for it. 
Does he apply this rule? Sure sounds to me like he applies this rule. <laughs> he certainly does. He's a, he's a big break from maybe even just the previous Republican nominee, uh, Mitt Romney. He ignored the pollsters. He, he solicited advice from experts everywhere, partially because he didn't have a stable of experts like usual nominees did. And he used that to win, and he, as you've seen, he very rarely apologizes. You say that this is a book that people should read who don't like Donald Trump. Why? He beat them all, and he won, and this is a book about lessons, and it's kind of a funny book, too. Lessons you can take from his life and his strategy to dominate, even if you're not president, to dominate in your local community, to do well with your family. He's a successful family man. So even if you don't like it, you probably want to learn from it. You do. <laughs> okay. You might do it again. That's right. All right. Thank you so much, Christopher Bedford. The Art of the Donald Lessons from America's Philosopher-in-Chief and also Editor-in-Chief at the Daily Caller Foundation. Thanks for having me. Finally, tonight it wasn't about tricks and tweeting at the White House last night, but tricks and treating. <laughs> The theme from the Munsters was playing as children from D.C. area schools and military families were invited to the White House for early trick-or-treating. It was decorated with these spider webs, that's kind of creepy, pumpkins, and one was even carved, I think, looked like George Washington. All of this while the President and First Lady handed out treats. For all of us here at EWTN News Nightly, to all of you around the world, thank you for watching. I'm Lauren Ashburn.